This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show, where we're always discovering how to make way more money and pay way less taxes. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of Wealth Ability. So, most of us listening here and participating are business owners, and our biggest single asset is our business. So two questions come up. First of all, what's my business going to be worth when I retire, and how do I make it worth more? Or second, how do I access the capital markets, and what, what are the capital markets looking for in my business if they want to invest in the business? We've had a lot of, a lot of investment in small businesses in the last couple of years. I've seen it with my clients and a, a lot of this is going on. The valuations are much higher because of course cap rates are lower, interest rates are lower. So that, that, that pushes up valuations. But we have an expert on this. We have Chris Volk, who uh, whose book is The Value Equation. He, he, he's an expert in valuing businesses and accessing capital markets as experience um, launching public companies. So Chris, welcome to our show. Really appreciate it. Well, Tom, I'm delighted to be here, and, and uh, thanks for agreeing to, to, to talk with me. It's perfect. No, absolutely. So, Chris, if you would just give us a little bit about of your background, and uh, you know where you know what you've done in the capital markets, and how you came up with this whole idea of coming up with a value equation and analyzing a business this way. Sure. So, I'm I, my background is I came out of commercial banking years ago, and uh, one of my customers was based out in Arizona. I was in Atlanta at the time, and so I moved out to Arizona, not knowing a soul, and. Um, been here ever since, and I know you 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 reside in the same state. So, um, and uh, uh, the company I went to work for uh, was a company that owned uh, chain restaurant properties, just the real estate, and rented it to the tenants that were there. If you're a if you're a restaurant operator or you're a real estate intensive company, you have a choice of whether you own or rent the real estate. And and basically, I've had spent a lot of my life convincing people they're better off having a landlord than a banker. So, um, and. We uh, ultimately took that company public on the New York Stock Exchange in 1994, uh, sold it later on to GE, uh, but then uh, the founder of that company and I started another company and we took that public on the New York Stock Exchange and sold that one. And then finally in uh, 2011, I started another company with a group of folks and we took that public on the exchange in 14 and I was the founding CEO of that company for 10 years and I stepped down at the end of last year to be able to do things like this. and. Uh, uh, but that company today has an equity cap that's somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 billion, and it's uh, one of the larger uh, so-called net lease real estate investment trusts on the New York Stock Exchange. So I've had a lot of experience raising both private and public equity, uh, private and public debt. Awesome. So thank you. Oh, this is, this is great. So um, let's start with the, the real basics. So if, if you would kind of walk through... Um, your value equation, just because I want I want business owners to understand uh, how important cash is and how important cash is to the value. And so, if you just kind of walk through that, because I, I know you're a big it's cash flow, it's cash flow, it's cash flow. Um, how how just basic? How do you value? How do you value a business? Right. So, uh, so the book is the value equation, and the value equation does exist. It's a, a six variable equation. So. Uh, I, I started off life as a credit geek and, and modeled a lot of companies. And I know you've looked at a lot of companies' financial statements. And some companies are just flat better than other companies. I mean, that's just, it is what it is. I mean, you have different business models and some are just better than other companies. And, uh, and so as I was looking at this, I uh, started creating very large complex models. And then I started distilling them down to simpler and simpler models. And then ultimately the idea was to throw away the spreadsheet altogether and create just sort of a six variable financial model that is universal. It's a relative thing. It's it almost, the numbers almost don't matter, you know? Um, and, uh, and if you do that and it's all based upon, as you said, cash flow. So it's, it's, it's getting through the, um, getting through sort of the, the distractions of accounting uh, and focusing on finance, which is, is finance is sort of like music. It's, it's a universal language. Accounting is not a universal language, you know? And so, so you want to get down to the music and, and really understand it. And it all starts with, your current equity return, your current return on equity. And then if you reinvest that, you can get compounding of return, which, which increases your growth. So you have a core business, you have a current return on it, you can reinvest that, 
You can generate higher levels of growth. And the idea of a business value is how much would somebody pay for that current return, given the risks and growth prospects that your company has? And uh, it's, it's pretty much that simple. And valuing a business is um, equally simple. You're just starting off with OPM, which is other people's money that's used to fund the business. And I'm talking talk about equity here. I'm talking about uh, borrowings and lease, you know, lease proceeds from companies like the ones I used to run. And you're taking OPM and you're saying, I want to maximize OPM. And then you plug for equity. I mean, equity is sort of the, the plug, you know, and you add the two numbers together and you get business value. So it's not that, that complicated. And, um, and the idea is, if you're, if you're trying to create wealth, I mean, and I'm talking about creating wealth, not just assembling wealth, but creating it. Um, the idea is to make a company worth more than a cost to build, you know, right. and most businesses in America actually don't rise to that level. Most companies in America don't end up being worth more than they cost to build. When you factor in how much you're reinvesting in the business every year and whatnot, uh, most companies just don't rise to that level. But if you're trying to raise money from institutional investors or sell out to private equity firms, um, it really helps to have a company that could be worth more than the cost to, to build. And if you look at the richest people on the Forbes 400 list, that's what happened to them. They all created wealth. I mean, the wealth like almost just created from thin air and rained down on them. And, and, yeah. and in their cases, they became worth uh, a lot of money. For sure. So let's distill this down even more if we can. So let's go as basic as we can, um, Chris. Um, and I'll give you my theory. And then mm -hmm. you can poke holes in it or you can tell me, okay, what do we need to add to this? So to me, all investing is very similar. doesn't matter if it's real estate, stock market, business, doesn't matter because it's all uh, some kind of a multiple of cash flow. So if I don't have any other people's money, so let's say all we have is our own equity. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's the simplest kind of business. You only have your own equity. You bootstrapped. You put all your own money in. Um, it's your money in there. So if you take your cash flow, okay, how do you value, how do you come up with what that multiple is to come up with what the value is of your company? In other words, what factors right. are people looking at to determine is that a multiple of three, five, 10, 12, 25, like the, like the stock market? What is it? All right, so you start off with, with what's called operating profit margin, which is a right. cash flow profit margin. So it's, it's basically an EBITDA number or EBITDA number as a percentage of revenues. Um, uh, if you're public companies, you got even more non-cash stuff. So, like, so uh, I'm going to stop you right there because I want to make sure everybody understands everything you're saying, Chris. Sure. So EBITDA, for, for any of you who are not familiar with that term, is earnings before interest. Uh, taxes, depreciation, taxes, depreciation amortization, amortization, right? Amortization, so right. It's yes. those things that it's the operational income, basically. Correct. It's, it's the sort of cash flow for the business. But against that cash flow from the business, you have to subtract. Now, in this case, you, you're just funding with, with all equity. So you have no debt and, and presumably you have no OPM. You're, it's all equity. Uh, so uh, against that cash flow, you have to subtract uh, what I would call maintenance capex. Maintenance capex is that number where you have to reinvest capital into the business every year, let's say you're a consumer facing industry business, and you have people coming into your shop, hypothetically, I mean, um, you have to sort of make that shop look pretty and, and reinvest in, in whatever it is that the equipment is, it has wear and tear, you're reinvesting that. Um, every five years, you may do a remodel, I mean, uh, uh, something like that. So it's not just a one time thing. So you're trying to average out sort of what the, the main is capex. Which, which is actually, so ironically enough, is the whole point of depreciation. We just don't use it that way anymore. But that's the whole point of depreciation. No, I want to I want to back out depreciation because it's an accounting guess, right? Right. So, for example, if you were looking at um, the public companies that I ran, so you look at store capital listed on the New York Stock Exchange, um, it throws off a flat ton of depreciation. I mean. Uh, but nobody who's analyzing that company cares about the depreciation because they know it's not real. And in fact, right. uh, this is what happens with real estate. So uh, you're depreciating an asset that doesn't depreciate because right. when we sell the asset, it sells for, for basically what we paid for it or more, right? Um, uh, and, but with many companies, um, depreciation is absolutely totally real. Um, and uh, sometimes accountants underestimate and sometimes they overestimate depreciation. And uh, and depreciation is an accounting convention. It's not a finance convention. Right. So what you're trying to do with your business value is forget about the accounting and focus on the pure finance. Focus on what do I have to invest in this business every year? Uh, one of the things I always just sort of get 
wound up about when it comes to accounting conventions is you can't really make an asset worth less money. I mean, if you're an entrepreneur and you spend a million dollars of your own money, you know you spent a million dollars. If some accountant says it's now depreciated to 900,000, it doesn't matter to you. You still have the million dollars invested, right? right. You can't make a million dollars make magically worth 900,000. It just doesn't work this way. So, um, so what you're doing is you're taking your equity in the business and then every year you're putting more money back into the business to kind of keep it up. Um, uh, and, uh, and that's the maintenance capex. Anyway, so when you have that free cash flow after that, um, uh, there, there's an amount of cash flow and that's the cash flow from your business. And, and that cash flow has certain characteristics. Your business has a certain amount of risk. When people are looking at that business, they're saying, gee, it's got this risk. I, I'm nervous about it. For example, if you have like one location in your business, one location is risky. If you have 50 locations, less risky. Um, um, so, uh, so you have a certain amount of risk in your business. The second thing is um, uh, you have certain growth characteristics. Is your sales going to grow 5% a year, 3% a year? Um, and when you take that free cash flow and you put it into the business again, you can compound that growth. And here's a really important point, Tom, which is that when you're calculating the operating profit margin of the business, it's after your salary. You know, a lot of right. a lot of business right. owners forget this. You know, they they think that somehow um, the return on equity is their salary. No, that's the investor. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I mean, if you weren't there, you'd have to hire somebody else yeah. to do this. Yeah, let me give you an example. So I I I know somebody who um, has a contracting business, and they make a net of sixty thousand dollars a year, but they do all the contracting work. And I'm right. going, so how much would it cost you to replace yourself? Well, how much would you have to pay somebody? Well, $60,000 a year. I'm going, so your business is worth zero. Exactly. He, he, thinks, his is, he thinks his business is worth like half a million dollars. I'm going, why would anybody pay you for a business when you're really just getting a job? Um, that, that's a very common thing. And a lot of times companies that are formed in America, we're a country of small businesses. Um, uh, a lot of those companies are vehicles for people to create jobs. And there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. I mean, you could be making $60,000 a year and you're investing some money and you're doing all the things that uh, uh, you and, and you know tell your people to do in terms of trying to have less debt, make your money work for you. Sure. You're doing all those right things. So you can actually accumulate wealth doing that. Uh, but the, the people in the United States and around the world, <clears throat> historically, who've made the most money have created businesses that are worth more than they cost to create. Um, and okay, so uh, and so that's, far, that's hard. let me let me get this, Chris. So far, we've got our free cash flow. Then we're assessing risk, and then we're assessing growth. What else do we need to to, to assess here? Well, then the next thing you need to know is um, what would another investor require? What kind of current return would another investor require? Um, uh, so, if for example, you're making you know twenty percent on your money, you know, uh, which by the way is not you know, unusual. I mean, a lot of people are making far higher than that. Um, but let's say you're making 20% on your money sure. and a like-minded investor wanting to buy a business with similar uh, growth prospects and risks is willing to make 10%. So now, you know, not, uh, you know, 20 divided by 10 becomes your equity valuation multiplier. That is your, you know, so you take your equity, now your, your multiplier is two. <laughs> so you take the amount of equity you have in cost times two, and that's, what your company, what your equity is worth. It's not what your company is worth because you have to add the debt uh, if there's OPM. But in, in our case, you're talking about just equity. So now you, you've doubled your money. In, in, um, in real estate, that would be our cap rate, right? Yeah, exactly right. And, and to your point, all businesses are uh, very much the same. So in real estate, it's a function of, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, I mean, the business model is exactly the same. I mean, if you're taking doing the six variables, it's sure. all the same. And you're backing into the returns other people are going to want to have. So if somebody is willing to have, a, in this case, a lower cap rate, um, uh, then, then you've, and you've, and you've created the property. Maybe you built a multifamily apartment complex and you've uh, created it from scratch and, and your cap rate or your, the money you're earning on your uh, investment works out to being 10%, but you can sell for a cap rate of six, you know, uh, so then, or let's say five again, you know, and then you've got, doubled. You've, you've doubled it, you know, so you've doubled your money, right? Exactly. If, you're, if you're funded with 100% equity, if you're funded with OPM, you've done better than that. Right. right. So, um, okay. So we've got uh, the return expectation. What else do we have to factor in? Um, I think that's it. You know, I mean, you're, you, okay. you've got, 
what you're making. I mean, it's just not that it's cool. not, not that, that hard. hard. It's not that no. hard. Okay. So, so uh, let me, let me ask you a question. You're going in and you're analyzing a business. Okay. You've done that. You've built several businesses. You've analyzed probably thousands of businesses. What do you, besides this formula, what are you looking at? For example, um, not all cash flow is created equal. And so, for example, is it take a, take a, um, a, um, somebody who sells cars. Okay. How important is it to be having recurring revenue from the same customers versus revenue from new customers? As an example, we know it's easier to make money on existing customers and it's harder to acquire new customers, but how important is that when you're looking at, at, at analyzing or evaluating the business? Well, the ability to recur revenues is just always important. It takes away the risk. Um, uh, if you have to, if you if you have to make a new sale every year, I was looking at, at a company for somebody recently, uh, and they had a service component where they actually got servicing fees from existing customers um, uh, for maintaining uh, equipment that they had sold, and then they had revenues coming in from new equipment that they were selling to new customers every year, and the mix was much higher on the uh, new sales of assets or new sales of equipment to, to new customers every year than the, than the ongoing servicing revenues. And that's a much riskier mix because you have to basically start start from scratch. You know, wake, you wake up on January 1st in the year and, you're, mm -hmm. you're, and you've got a blank slate and you got to do it all over again. And uh, uh, so the less you have to do all over again, uh, the better you are. Got it. What, what other things would uh, you know, if we look at the risk factor, because that's probably, that's one of the big ones here, right? So the, the, the less risky the asset, the, the lower the cap rate, basically. Right. So, so what types of things from a market standpoint, what kinds of things are, is the market looking at that are, that they'd like to see in a less risky company other than recurring, re recurring revenues? Yeah, they're looking for companies that basically have a moat. They have a defense. They have a defensive uh, position where it's hard for them to lose revenue, or hard for them to. Uh, they can defend their prices. They can uh, not have uh, uh, margin erosion. Um, they can keep the customers they have. They're you know people are looking for what is that competitive advantage a company has to be able to do what it is that they do over and over again. Um, if they um, you know, companies are all about addressing a problem. You, I mean, if you're right. if you're creating a company, you're you're solving somebody's problem. I mean, you're you're providing a service in some way that's solving a problem. If um, if you're providing a problem, uh, if you're if you're solving a problem, and that problem is a very large problem and it's universal, maybe it's global. You know, um, then you have the ability to expand your company in a very large way. Most companies are not like that. They are they're defining sort of more localized mm. you know, uh, problems, but you know, if you're looking at the Forbes 400, the people who started those companies, these are companies that were scalable. You know, they were solving very large problems. They were kind of global. The the the, the companies defined. Um, most of us are not in that ballpark. You know, so we're, we're you know different places. And so if you're buying, if you're making an investment in a company, you're looking at what can you do to uh, expand this company. How can it grow? Um, especially when people are buying companies. Um, uh, you can rarely buy a company at a at a good price uh, doing just what the seller did. I mean, uh, uh, oftentimes the prices that sellers get, uh, and, and you and I were talking about this before the show, is if sellers sometimes don't think they're getting enough, you know, but 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 really uh, from a return perspective, sometimes the sellers are getting a return that's, that's so high when they sell their business that the people buying it aren't, aren't going to be satisfied with the return that on, on the money. So they're going to have to take uh, the seller's business and actually find ways to make it better, you know, and what you, what you look at in the, in the value equation is there are six variables to doing a business and they're divided between um, operating efficiency variables, asset efficiency variables, and capital efficiency variables. So you got, you know, three types of variables and so pretty much two variables piece, six variables total. Um, and so people are going to be pushing on those levers to see what they can do to sort of make the business a better business generating higher returns on equity and the higher returns on equity create the higher value. And that, that that's, uh, that's what people are going to do. Interesting. So you, you've talked, I've, I, I've seen interviews with you where you've talked about the difference between just bootstrapping the company versus going out to the capital markets and accessing capital. And you've 
done some very serious accessing of capital. You talk mm-hmm. about a business where you went out and raised $500 million right off the bat. So mm-hmm. what, what is it that the business owner, first of all, when does a business owner go out to the capital markets? And second of all, what is it that they need to be able to show in order to access that capital? All right. So, so uh, again, it's, you know, you're solving big problems, small problems. You're dealing with how much capital does your business need? So I've been engaged in the real estate finance business. Real estate is expensive. I mean, I mean, you know how expensive it is. I mean, just right. one apartment complex or one chicken store can cost some, some money. So, so uh, uh, I mean, you're, I mean, you're looking at a, a Burger King or a Taco Bell can cost $3 million. So, so if you're trying to be the landlord to those kinds of companies, you need an awful lot of money. I mean, uh, and so I couldn't bootstrap it in that sense because I didn't have the kind of money it takes to really do this. Um, so what I chose to do was to go to institutional investors and and to raise the money. Um, and as you probably as you probably know, with with the businesses you deal with, there's uh, the art of raising large amounts of money, and and I, I've been involved in raising large amounts of money. Um, uh, and then there's the art of raising small amounts of money. And uh, in our world today, almost raising large amounts of money is actually not that difficult. There are a lot of people that have lots and lots of money today. Um, what's more difficult is assembling a good leadership team that's going to do the business, a good vision for how you're going to do it, and a business model uh, that's going to generate returns higher than the uh, expectations of like-minded investors so you can create companies worth more than they cost. Because no investor is going to invest the money unless they think they can make uh, a return that's more than what the company costs to put together. Yeah, I, I, I hope everybody replace that piece right there because I think that's a little piece of magic, Chris, is that you're looking, an investor's looking for returns higher than the cost. I mean, it's no different than, I mean, if you go to a bank, you don't want, if, if you're borrowing money for real estate, you don't want to borrow money at a higher cost than you want to make. I mean, if, you're, right. if your cap rate is lower than your interest rate, you're in trouble, right? Rule number one. And, and, and this is one of the things that people misunderstand is, is that an investor, okay, so if you look at the S&P 500 for its, its whole lifespan, the return's been kind of in the neighborhood of nine or 10% a year. Um, obviously, there's a lot of volatility to that, but it's been nine or ten percent a year. So that basically might suggest that your average business person is happy making nine or ten percent a year, right? Um, so that means that if you have a company and it's generating a nine or ten percent rate of return on equity a year, you know, um, uh, or let's say a total rate of return is a little bit different, but a total rate of return of nine or ten percent, um, that company won't be worth more than the cost to create because it's it, you're you're hitting what that investor wanted. I mean. Um, Nice company is generating nine to ten percent a year. Can you make money on that? Sure. And can you invest money? Can you can you become rich doing that? You you can become rich doing that. Um, uh, what investors would like to see is a company that's making twenty percent um, because they'd like to be able to not only make that ten percent, but they'd like to be able to have the gain on top of that by flipping the company and and doubling their investment on top of that ten percent. They're they're looking for a, a much bigger pop. Well, Maybe it's right. a fifteen percent. So, they, they, so this, they, they, they want to buy at a at a 20% cap rate and sell at a 10% cap rate. That's what exactly. we all want. Exactly. And, and so so they're not interested in just making you know a nice return from a passive investment. I mean, when we're all sitting at in our desk and we're buying stocks, I mean, these stocks are supposed to pay you a return. I mean, this is what you're doing. I mean, it, right. it's part of the corporate cost of capital. But um, but the people that are in the Forbes 400 didn't make that. <laughs> uh, what they did was they 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 actually almost created wealth from thin air. This is something only businesses can do, you know? And so there are a lot of, there are a number of books. I mean, I, and I've read a lot of your books and stuff and I love them. And, um, and books talk about how people get rich, right? Um, but the richest people in the world made their money in business. Um, always. And, always. Uh, always. And, and they made their money by making those businesses worth more than they cost to create. And so, there's no book that I know of written about business that says how do businesses create wealth. And so I decided I was going to write a, write that book. So so the book is on how do businesses create wealth, and, and that's the idea is how to, basically how did the richest people get there, and and that's what you get. I, I love it. You know, it's what what I love what you're doing, Chris, is simplifying it because 
Um, you know, business owners, we're so involved in our mission and we're so involved in our people and we're so involved in the day to day that it's very hard to step back and it's very hard to just go in and analyze. Okay, so how do I maximize my business value? How do I get to where I want to go? As, as we were talking um, um, before we started recording and you were saying, well, look, here's one of the problems. A business owner sells, they're getting 20% on their money. They sell, then they go reinvest it and they're getting 5% on their money and they're not living the same. And they're going, what's going on here? Well, you're not getting the same return on your investment as you did in your business, right? No, you know, and I, I have a very good friend who just sold his construction business. Um, uh, another business, another friend that sold a, an IT business. Both of them did fabulously well. Both of them, uh, uh, you would have, you would have been proud of both of them because they both managed to 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 keep their tax bills to a minimum over the years. Um, uh, but then all of a sudden, when they sell, they're paying that huge tax check. So there is there comes a time where sometimes you just can't avoid taxes. And so you're, they're paying a bigger tax check, and then they're having to reinvest those net after tax proceeds into uh, something that's going to give them retirement return. And uh, and there's no way they can make a return that's equal or even close to what they were right. making when they ran the business. And that's just a reality. And 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 it means that when you're selling a business, it's a very personal decision for people. And and uh, they're, they're doing it because they don't have uh, successors. They're doing it for lifestyle reasons, for personal goals. Um, and uh, and so I appreciate all those decisions. But I also appreciate why people never sell too. Because, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a challenge when you when you sell to be able to reinvest the money. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I mean, I look at our business and I'm going, yeah, there's, there's no way I'm ever going to make the kind of returns um, in, in somebody else's business than I make in my business. And there's no way I'm going to make them um, with as low a risk, right? Because when you're in control of your business, you, you actually you have a much lower risk. You, uh, you understand the business intimately. You know exactly what you're doing every single day. I mean, uh, uh, you know, most of us are not uh, acclimated to sort of buying stocks and bonds and, and uh, <laughs> investing in, in, in things that are going to uh, generate rates of return. And I, I think there's a certain amount of risk to all of that stuff. I mean, you look at the S&P 500 and, um, you know, the, the top 20 stocks or something are a very huge portion of the index. So you, so you're really not as diversified as you think. And, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the dividend yields on the S&P 500 are less than two. And so you get, you know, from a return perspective, it's just very hard. It's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, and the reality is, I mean, I look at my business and, you know, somebody else looks at me and they go, how do you live with that much risk every day? I'm going, what do you mean? I'm not in the stock market. I mean, that's risk every day. Uh, just being, being something where I don't control that amount of risk. I don't control what happens. I don't control the sales. I don't control what goes on in the company. And now all of a sudden you've given up all that control. You really do. You really, I think you've increased your risk significantly because you don't have control over it. Well, I mean, for me, when I was, I've run three public companies and I never sold a share of stock ever when I was running the companies because I understood them and I, and, and they've always been disproportionate shares of my net worth and I didn't care. Yep. There you go. So we have here, the, the book is the value equation, uh, Chris Volk. So Chris, uh, if you could just su sum it up, uh, maybe the top three lessons uh, for business owners in valuing their business. Uh, top three lessons. Um, gosh, there's, there's so many of them. Um, you know, uh, the book is full of a lot of stories. And, and um, uh, I would say as you're building uh, companies, you know, you're focusing on trying to, to manage risk. You're trying to sleep well at night. Um, uh, and uh, and no business ever went out of business because they lost money. Uh, they've always they always go out of business because they run out of cash, uh, and that's just a different that's a different issue, you know. Uh, so if you're going to set up a business and you're trying to minimize the risk, you're trying to minimize the chance that you, you're going to run out of cash. Um, the the second thing is just the importance of compounding. I mean, uh, uh, if you can refrain from taking dividends. Uh, so for example, most of the greatest businesses. Um, and, mo and the richest people in the world. And, and you take a look at Berkshire Hathaway, it doesn't pay a dividend. I mean, um, uh, so, uh, so, you know, Warren Buffett's a big believer in compounding that interest by reinvesting it, reinvesting that cash flow at the same kind of return. So if your company is generating a 20% return on equity uh, and you could uh, reinvest it and make 20% on that, I mean, it's just an incredible thing. And you look at, at what Berkshire's done over the years, return-wise relative to other companies, it's huge, you know. Um, 
Uh, and um, so your return on equity is the same thing as what's called a sustainable growth rate. So if, you're, if your return on equity is, uh, call it, let's say it's 50%, that means that you can grow your business 50% if you reinvest the money every year, right? You can grow your, right. your, your income 50% if you reinvest the money every year. That's a heck of a compounding number. And that, that adds to growth. And that's how the people in the Forbes 400 got there. So they're managing risk. They're, uh, uh, and then the last thing is to focus on Focus on the capital stack too, because the capital stack is, and as being OPM and, and equity, the, the mix of capital stack doesn't fall off a tree. It, it takes work, you know, and a lot of people uh, need to focus on it. And they don't need to just, the idea is not to minimize the cost of, the, of, of OPM always. A lot of times it's to have the greatest flexibility in your business. Again, so you can sleep well at night. I mean, the whole thing is to put it together. And over the years, we've taken down equity and debt at prices that you know people would have uh, shuddered at, but we knew we could put the money together well and, and make money, make returns on that. And uh, one of my uh, former mentors, uh, who used to be chairman of our first company, would say, "Availability capital is everything," you know, and uh, and it is, you know. So uh, don't don't ever uh, uh, discount that. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Chris. So where would we find uh, our listeners find more information about you other than buying your book? The value equation. Where else can we get more information from you, Chris? Okay, so so, so I will have a website up. Uh, so it's under under uh, construction, and it'll be thevalueequation.com. And great. Uh, and today, if they're looking to pre-order the book, it's on Amazon. So it's the value equation, and, and they click me up, and and I'll be there. And and uh, um, and uh, you know, I had a lot of help in writing this book over the over the last two years, and um, uh, I had a lot of proofers and people that uh, that supported it, including investors at Store, uh, our last public company that I ran, and um, uh, and and academics too. So from uh, uh, from ASU and other schools, and I teach classes at Cornell. So so I've I've had a lot of input that's really helped us out, and um, and I'll be uh, posting to a blog on the on the website, and I'll be writing articles and. Uh, and I'm, awesome. you know, always thrilled to talk to, to, to guys like you. So awesome. Thank audience. you. It's uh, Chris Volk. The book is the value equation. Um, highly recommend this because, uh, you know, for most of us, our business is our most valuable asset. It is our nest egg and, uh, it is our highest rate of return that we're ever going to get. And there's ways to maximize that. And it's not that difficult. And when you do that, I, one thing I will say is you don't always have to pay tax on the exit. Um, that's what we're good at. And when, when you get this information, when you really understand it, you're always going to make way more money and pay way less tax. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.